Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Tormone. I'm the Associate Executive Director of Alumni Engagement and Outreach here at the University of Maryland Alumni Association. And we appreciate you joining us today for How Leaders Speak the Fundamentals, presented by alumnus and Dr. and Dr. Stephen D. Cohen. Um, I'm going to read a short bio, and then I'm going to turn the reins over to Dr. Cohen for him to give the presentation. Dr. Stephen D. Cohen is an instructor at the Harvard Division of Continuing Education and an assistant professor of communication at the University of Baltimore's Klein Family School of Communication Design. He is an accomplished scholar and dynamic speaker who has delivered more than 100 courses and workshops on public speaking and workplace communication. He has been quoted in publications such as the Financial Times and the Baltimore Sun and was featured in the BBC Radio 4 documentary, Churchill's Secret Cabinet. Dr. Cohen currently is currently conducting research in two primary areas, the intersections between public speaking and leadership development, and the design and delivery of oral communication training programs. He is particularly interested in the use of experiential exercises and technology-based approaches to help promote communication competence. Dr. Cohen's work has appeared in College Teaching, Communication Teacher, the International Journal of Listening, Listening Education, Relevant Rhetoric, and Toastmaster Magazine. Dr. Cohen is the author of two, two books, Public Speaking, The Path to Success, and Lessons from the Podium, Public Speaking as a Leadership Art. He is also the editor of On the Path to Success, Readings and Resources, a collection of thought-provoking articles on the art and practice of public speaking. Dr. Cohen previously served as Managing Director of the Oral Communication Program at the University of Maryland. As part of this role, he managed assessment initiatives, curriculum development, and instructor training for a large-scale general education program. Dr. Cohen earned a PhD in Communication from the University of Maryland, a Master in Public Policy from Harvard University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration summa cum laude from the University of Florida. He also earned an advanced Toastmaster designation from Toastmasters International. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Cohen. Thank you, Tim, and hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to How Leaders Speak the Fundamentals. I want to thank Tim very much for that kind introduction and especially thank the University of Maryland Alumni Association for hosting this two-part series. I'm really excited about our time together both today and in two weeks. And before we get going, I want to give a little overview of this two-part series. Today what we're going to focus on is the fundamentals, understanding some of the basics of how to speak like a leader, how to stand up in front of an audience and speak with power, poise, and confidence. In two weeks we're going to delve a bit more into more advanced techniques, that is, how do we build on what we learned today? How do we take our skills to the next level and become powerful public speakers? Those more advanced techniques will be covered in a separate webinar two weeks from today. And I encourage all of you, especially if you enjoy today's webinar and want to continue to refine your skills, to register for that webinar as well. And reminders will be sent out in the next two weeks. But today I want to focus on the fundamentals of how leaders speak, some of the techniques, skills, and ideas that we can use to feel more confident and more competent when we stand up in front of any audience. Let's look at today's agenda. Today the focus is to learn how to build a connection, a strong connection with the audience sitting or perhaps standing in front of us from the moment we enter a room. In particular, I want to cover three main themes or three main ideas. First, I want to talk about how to exude leadership qualities. Since the theme of this two-part series is how leaders speak, it's especially important that we spend some time drawing the connection between communication and leadership. And that's particular, particularly rather my area of research. As a professor, my books and my writing focuses on the connection between leadership and communication and how specifically we can use our voice to lead. So that's going to be an important theme and one idea I want to delve into in some depth. Second, I want to focus today on how to eliminate filler words from our vocabulary. Filler words, those pesky words that seem to permeate much of what we say. And I want today to share some strategies 
for eliminating those words from our vocabularies so the audience can focus exclusively on the content of our message and our delivery. And finally, and importantly, I want to focus on how to make the audience care about your message. There's so many competing messages out there. And what I want to help all of us do on the line today, especially as Terps, as people who care about our work, our ideas, is how to get our ideas through to our audience members. With everything going on, how do we make those messages resonate with our audience and make them care? That's what I want to cover today. Because if we can master or at least get a stronger handle on these techniques, on these themes, then we will have the skills necessary to build a strong connection with our audience members from the moment we enter the room. Now, one idea I want to share at the outset is that every time we deliver a presentation, we are in fact leading. Our job isn't simply to communicate ideas to our audience members. Rather, our job is to show them that they can trust us, follow us, and believe in us. That's the power of leadership, and that's what leadership communica communication rather is all about. Not just sharing ideas, but rather leading an audience and making them want to follow us into battle, whatever that battle may be, whether it's to increase sales or revenue figures, whether it's to promulgate or advocate for some important public policy, or whether it's to improve our grades in a classroom setting. Whatever it may be, we want to show our audience that they have what it takes to lead, and our role as leaders is to use our voice, use our voice to make that happen. So I hope you're as excited as I am about today's session. And I thought a great place to start before we talk about exuding leadership qualities is to get a sense about our comfort level with public speaking. So Tim, if you wouldn't mind taking the reins here and introducing our first poll question. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> How comfortable are you with public speaking? Very uncomfortable, uncomfortable, somewhat comfortable, Comfortable or very, very comfortable. It should say very comfortable. Sorry about that. Please vote now. Okay, with almost 87 people voting, 87% voting, we have 8% very uncomfortable, 12% uncomfortable, 28% somewhat comfortable, 37% comfortable, and 15% very comfortable. Interesting, Tim. So most of the audience here is comfortable, which I'm glad to hear. It looks like actually more than half of the audience rates themselves as comfortable or very comfortable, which is, which is great to hear. But that means that half of us on the line have a little bit less comfort or somewhat comfort, some are, uh, a degree of comfort rather, with public speaking. And that's nice to hear. I want to make sure that we address all of your needs and concerns today as it comes to some of the fundamentals. So I'll make sure to gear my comments appropriately, focusing not only on those of us who are less comfortable, but also those of us who are more comfortable. So thanks very much for that feedback. And I think what's also interesting about that distribution is to show us that many of us as leaders have different levels of comfort with public speaking, but there are many reasons for that discomfort. And we're going to talk about those degrees or those reasons in today's webinar, why we're more or less comfortable with public speaking. Great. Well, let's go on and begin by talking about leadership qualities, the theme, as I mentioned, of our webinar series. First thing I want us to think about is thinking and acting like a leader from the moment we enter a room. Now this is so important because if we hold ourselves like a leader, then we're more likely to be perceived as a leader. There's this idea from social psychology called thin slicing. It's this notion that people make snap judgments of us as soon as they see us. Scary in a way, isn't it? But the truth is that people already are able to form a perspective of us and have an opinion of us before we even open our mouths. So that's why it's so important to think and act like leaders. So we can't 
exactly control what people think, but we can manage it. And I want to talk about three techniques that we can use to manage the way people perceive us and to manage better those snap judgments that people make about us as speakers and as leaders. The first technique is to develop a leadership mindset. We want to realize that we have something of value to offer. That's important. We have to believe in ourselves and our ability to lead. There is an idea from the research called visualization. And visualization is a technique where we imagine or visualize ourselves succeeding. We actually think about the sequence of steps we're going to take from the moment we enter the room to the moment we hear that applause at the end of our presentation. Visualization is powerful because it fights against the negative self-talk that sometimes impedes our ability to speak with power. The worry that we're going to fail or that we're going to be judged or that people are going to laugh at us. So we need to visualize ourselves succeeding. We can do it as we're getting ready in the morning. We can do it while we're in our offices before that presentation. We can even go into an empty room beforehand and go through those steps. But it's so important that we visualize ourselves succeeding and that we push out of our heads any negative ideas or self-talk that may be coming in conflict with our willingness and our desire to succeed. That leadership mindset is critical. And so I often tell my students, besides visualizing themselves in advance, visualizing themselves succeeding rather in advance, that as they're walking on stage, they tell themselves, I got this, I'm going to rock it. It may seem silly, but it really works. Rather than focusing on that nervousness that sometimes comes over us as we're about to step in front of a lectern or up on stage or in front of a group of colleagues, let's remind ourselves in our head, I got this, I'm going to rock it, I'm going to do well, I know my stuff and I'm ready to succeed. That is a research tested way to be more successful in front of an audience, visualizing ourselves being successful is the key. Second, we want to dress one step above our audience. Now, this is an interesting idea because people will often say, Dr. Cohen, what should I wear when I'm speaking? Shouldn't I always wear a business suit or something more formal? And actually, it's important to be an important yet accessible leader. That's why sometimes we see the president, President Obama, roll up his sleeves in front of an audience. He'll actually come up on stage in a jacket, he'll take his jacket off, and he'll roll up his sleeves. Now, couldn't he have done that before he stepped on stage? Of course he could have, but he does it purposely because he's trying to show you, trying to show us rather, that he's an important yet accessible leader. So he actually dresses down a bit more. The same thing is true when we're in front of our audience. We want to understand what our audience will be wearing and then dress slightly nicer than the people in the room. So if the people in the room or the dress code is generally jeans and polos, we might want to wear a more formal shirt and pants. We want to fight the temptation to always put on that suit and tie or that dressy business suit. Instead, we want to wear something that shows we should be taken seriously, but that we're also accessible. Now, if we don't know what our audience will be wearing, we could always ask the event organizer, or if need be, look at some photos, perhaps on an organization's website. But it's so important that we think about dress as a strategic tool that we can use to act like a leader and be perceived as confident and competent. Finally, on that note of confidence, we want to enter the room with confidence. We want to hold our head high and walk with purpose. We don't want to be slouched over or look nervous. That just filters into this feeling of nervousness. We want to practice putting our shoulders back. In fact, right now, no matter where you are, do me a favor. Sit up straight in your chairs. Let's say you're at your desk. Sit up straight with your feet firmly planted on the ground. Go ahead, try it. Put your shoulders back and hold your head high. Feels good. That's exactly what we want to do when we enter a room. And maybe we want to write ourselves a note to enter the room with confidence because that notion of walking with purpose gives purpose to our presentations and it shows our audience that we have what it takes to lead. So if we want to be perceived as a leader, if we want people to make snap judgments of us that are fair and on point and that feed into this notion of leadership, 
then we need to do these three things every time we're about to enter a room. One of the other ideas, one of the other things we want to do as we're trying to become more powerful leaders and more powerful speakers is to adjust our default public speaking settings. Now, default public speaking settings are essentially behaviors that we tend to do over and over again whenever we're speaking. Think about how we get ready in the morning. Some of us put on our shoes before our shirts, others our shirts before our shoes. Some of us tie our shoes with one loop, others with two. Some of us brush our teeth before we comb our hairs, while other our hair rather, while others of us comb our hair before we brush our teeth. We all have default ways of behaving and getting ready in the morning. Likewise, we all have default or typical or standard ways of speaking, certain behaviors that seem like second nature to us. Just like when someone sneezes, we say bless you without even thinking about it. Likewise, we do many things without even thinking about it when we're speaking. And up on screen, you'll see now some of the typical default public speaking settings that I see with my private clients. We use filler words. Often, we play with our hair or our rings or our watches or other jewelry. We clasp our hands nervously in front of us or behind us. We slouch and stand, we slouch or and or we stand with our legs crossed in front of us. And many of us often make awkward eye contact. The good thing to realize is that we're not alone. We all struggle with default public speaking settings. But what's important as leaders is identifying them. Take a minute right now and write down three of your default public speaking settings. Any of these up on screen or any that come to mind. Take a moment and write down three of your common default public speaking settings, the areas you'd most like to focus on. Let's take a quick pause. Now that we have those down, identifying it is half the battle. Because if we want to lead, we have to be cognizant of what we can improve. And so it's really helpful if we struggled with that exercise to perhaps record ourselves using our webcam, asking a colleague to put out, pull out her iPhone or an Android and record a work presentation or even speak in front of a mirror. Those are all great ways to see ourselves in action and to get real-time feedback. But it's so important that we identify our public speaking settings so we can better think and act like leaders. One other thing I want to note, a very interesting study that was published recently in the European Journal of Social Psychology, there was a study of, of a group of 51 females who, wanted, who claimed they wanted to eat less junk food. And researchers tried to figure out how to help these women do so. And they asked each of the participants to imagine the benefits of nibbling on healthier foods. Those women, those participants who were able to identify what made healthy snacking difficult for them and develop a plan to reach for healthy fruit when cravings hit were most successful at sticking with their goal. The same is true for all of us in public speaking. We have to be able to identify our triggers, identify what is standing in our path, and then put together a plan to reach for healthy solutions when we're faced with a challenge in front of an audience so that we too will be more successful. So it's so important, this is a notion by the way in research called mental contrasting. And mental contrasting is the idea that positive thinking and positive identification only works if we also identify what's holding us back. So that's why in the previous slide I talked about visualization. I talked about the importance of imagining ourselves succeeding. But now I'm introducing this idea for, of mental contrasting, which is the notion that it's not enough to imagine ourselves succeeding. We also have to figure out what's holding us back and put together a plan to address those issues. And that's why this exercise that we just did 
was so important. So we can identify what's holding us back and now hopefully continue speaking about a plan to improve or rather adjust our default public speaking settings. Great. Well, let's move on and talk about nervousness. Now, how do we push nervousness aside? I know this is a question that I get a lot. Where does nervousness come from and how do we get rid of us? Uh, get rid of it rather. The reason we're nervous is because often we're worried about being judged, as I mentioned on the outside of today's webinar, on the outset rather of today's webinar. We're worried about people laughing at us or thinking we're going to fail. But here's the truth. Our audience wants us to succeed. Our audience wants us to do well. They're on our side. They want to be entertained as much as we want to be successful. So we have to keep that in mind. We have to realize that it's not us versus the audience. We're on the same team facing the same fate with the same goals. That is so important to help assuage our concerns and our fears. But there are also some specific techniques that we can use beyond that general knowledge to push our nervousness aside. And I like this photo here of everyone looking so confident. <laughs> the first thing we want to try is turning our palms up. Go ahead, try it. Turn your palms up. Face up. Good. And now what I want you to do is breathe in and breathe out. This time, keep your palms up. Close your eyes. Deep breath in. Hold for a minute. And exhale. Now the reason this can be helpful is because sweat tends to accumulate when our palms are face down. Think about how we typically walk. If I were to ask you to get up and walk right now, you typically walk with your palms facing behind you or away from you. Instead, what I want us to try is turning our palms up and engaging in a breathing exercise. So hopefully sweat will be less likely to accumulate. And hopefully through breathing exercises, which are often written about in many public speaking books, and there are many different kinds, but I think the simple exhalation technique of breathing in with confidence, holding for a few seconds, and then exhaling fully can be really helpful in relaxing us and making our nervousness subside, at least for a few moments. Another technique we can try that I write about in my book, Lessons from the Podium, is this notion of the T repeater. Now the T repeater is another breathing exercise where we release short T sounds, the letter T. And T tends to be a hard consonant sound, so releasing it is a way of pushing out some of that nervousness. And the way this works again is we're going to breathe in and then we're going to release short T sounds. And I'm going to do it and you can then do it after me. And if there are people around you, maybe they'll be wondering what excitement you're experiencing at your cubicle or in your office right now and will want to join. But let's at least try it. Here's how it works. We're going to breathe in and then exhale short T sounds. Here's what it sounds like. Breathe in. That's the T repeater. So we breathe in and then we exhale short T sounds as a way to release our stress and our nervousness. I know it seems silly. I know and it won't work for everyone, but it does work for many, many people. Many of my students over many years find this technique really helpful. So I want us all to try it. Just give it a chance. Let's everyone breathe in and exhale those short T, those short T sounds till we're out of breath. Ready? Here we go. Breathe in. And let's use those T's. Hopefully for some of you, you now feel more relaxed. That's called the T repeater. And it's a, it's a technique that many people find helpful because we're releasing a hard consonant sound, which in a way helps release some of that stress. So those are a couple breathing exercises that I like to use that can be helpful, especially if we're nervous right before we're about to speak in front of an audience. It can be very helpful in alleviating some of that stress. The third and last technique I want to introduce, and this is another one I write about in my book, is this idea of easing into eye contact. Now, one of the reasons we're nervous is because we feel like the audience is staring at us. We feel like they're judging us with their eyes. 
And so one great way to overcome that nervousness is not to make eye contact with them at the beginning. Instead, and this only works from a distance, we can't do this when we're sitting within, let's say, 10 feet of someone, but let's say we're in front of a large audience or we're doing a PowerPoint presentation standing up and the conference table is pushed back, let's say, 50 feet. This works real well. Easing into eye contact means instead of looking at people directly, we can look at the area around their eyes or at the rims of their glasses. And then, once we're into our presentation already and we're not worried about being judged, we could ease into eye contact and actually look at them directly. So again, what I'm saying is, since at the beginning of our presentations we tend to be the most nervous, let's focus instead on our introduction and getting through those first few sentences by not looking at anyone. Instead, and again, this only works from a distance, up close people can tell, but from a little bit of a distance, if we look at the area around people's eyes and, we, and or look at the area near the rims of their glasses, if they're wearing glasses, it'll look like to them we're looking at their eyes when in fact we're not. So it's a great little trick to allow ourselves a few moments, uh, even a few, let's say 30 seconds even, to get into our presentation so we got going and we're more confident and then we could ease more gently into eye contact and start to look at our audience directly. So those are some techniques to help us push nervousness aside and to help us get over this worry about being judged or alleviate some of the stress or fear, typically called speech anxiety, that may come from speaking in front of an audience. So we talked about these three and we also talked about visualization earlier that can be helpful. One other thing I'd recommend is how important it is to practice. Often we're nervous because we don't know our material as well as we should or as well as we'd like. So it's so important to practice our presentation. And since we don't have a lot of time, I'm sure many of us on the call are busy professionals, we don't need to practice everything. Let's just practice the introduction, any particularly complex or difficult parts, and the conclusion. Because those tend to be the parts that are most significant. Why those three? Because in the introduction, people are forming their initial impressions of us. In any complex or particularly difficult parts, we worry about because we perceive them to be complex, and so we want to make sure we get them right. And they go, then the conclusion, because that's what we're leaving our audience with. And due to a phenomenon called recency bias, people tend to remember the la more often the last things they hear. So we can help manage use that bias to our advantage in a sense by practicing the conclusion. So that I hope helps you if you only have 15 minutes and you can't practice your whole hour long presentation, focus on the introduction, any particularly difficult or complex parts, and the conclusion. If we use these techniques, I promise you, you'll feel more confident the next time you speak in front of an audience. Let's move on now to eliminating filler words from our vocabulary. Now, there are so many common filler words, and you'll see a handful of them on screen. And we all use them. In fact, when I started researching and teaching about a decade ago, I could tell you that I used lots of them. And it was only through practice and refinement and some of the techniques I'm going to explain that I was able to fight this temptation of using filler words. So I want to share what I've learned with all of you, because as you see in this image, you don't want to be that speaker who's making the audience members think, please make it stop. <laughs> you want your audience to enjoy what you have to say and be engaged and immersed in the conversation. Tim, I'm actually ready now for a couple quick poll questions because I want to get a sense of how often our audience members use filler words. So maybe you could run through that first or the second poll question. Here's the second poll question. How often do you use filler words in informal conversation? Never, rarely, sometimes, often, or always? Please vote now. All right, we have about 87% of the people voting, and we have 0% never, 16% rarely, 
59% sometimes, 21% often, and 4% always. Interesting. So we all tend to use, at least to some degree, filler words in informal conversation. But now, Tim, I know we have a follow-up poll question. We do. And that question is, how often do you use filler words during a work presentation? Never, rarely, sometimes, often, or always? Please vote now. And once again, with about 87% of the people voting, we have 1% never, 31% rarely, 52% sometimes, 13% often, and 3% always. Very interesting. So it seems, at least with this audience, seems to be pervasive. There doesn't seem to be, at least based on initial glance, too much of a significant difference. I'd have to run some tests here. But 59 versus 52% in both situations say, they sometimes use filler words. And 16 versus 31 percent say they rarely use filler words. So at least from these initial statistics, there's some notion that filler words seems to pervade all of our conversation, whether it's informal or more formal. One of the reasons, though, we tend to get more nervous, generally in formal presentations, is because there's something at stake. There's a pressure that comes in more formal situations that may not be present informally. Nevertheless, we all struggle with filler words often because we don't know what to do with that silence. Especially in U.S. culture, silence is viewed negatively. And um, or other filler words, is just a way that we think verbally. We think aloud. Now, why do we use filler words in the first place? We use them because we've been conditioned to answer questions immediately from an early age. When our parents or guardians, whoever raised us, called or, or called on us, say, honey, come down here, or whatever they might say, we felt the need to answer right away. Or when they asked us a question at the dinner table, we felt compelled to answer because we wanted to show respect. Or when our teachers called on us in grade school, they expected an answer right away. They expected us to be alert and on our toes. So that need to answer right away has followed us as we've gotten older and transitioned into adulthood and into the professional world. We've never allowed ourselves to pause and give ourselves time to think about what we want to say before we say it. So that's why we have to be willing to adjust this default public speaking setting and think differently about filler words. Here are some other interesting research findings that I wanted to share that may shine some light on how filler words affect all of us. On average, we tend to experience some sort of disfluency, which is just a fancy word for speech interruption, because a filler word is a, a meaningless word that marks a pause or a hesitation in speech. In any case, these speech interruptions tend to occur roughly about 4.4 seconds. So they happen all the time. They're all around us. Interestingly, filler words also convey some meaning. A uh, tends to signal that the pause that's going to come next will be shorter, while um signals that that pause that's about to come up will be longer. It's interesting to note that filler words do, at least to some degree, convey useful information. There is some differences in terms of which filler words men and women use. Men tend to say a uh, and um more than women, but the overall rate at which both genders use filler words is the same. So it doesn't matter whether we're a man or a woman, we all tend to use filler words at roughly the same rate. Interestingly though, men and women tend to use different filler words. Men tend to use um and a, uh, and women tend to use like and you know. So it affects all of us, we just tend to use different filler words. And finally, whether or not the speaker and listener have a relationship or know each other in any way has no effect on a uh or um rates. And that may help explain why the polling questions came out the way they did, why it didn't really matter whether we were speaking informally or in a work setting. Because how well we know our audience has no effect 
according to one study on um and a uh rates. Interesting, huh? So there's a lot of research on filler words, and I wanted to shine some light on that for all of us. But of course, this webinar would be incomplete if we did talk about the fact that even the president uses filler words. Even our own president struggles with uh, and there's a great video. I'm not going to play it now because I'm not sure how this video will come up within the webinar system, but I, I created a short link for all of you here if you want to write that down. It's a great David Letterman segment on Barack Obama and his use of uh. It's called the Barack Obama account. It's great for a laugh, and it also reinforces the notion that even the president, even this eloquent speaker who has a cadre of speechwriters and coaches, struggles with filler words. We're not alone. We all struggle with filler words, and I want us to know that it's very, very normal, but there is something we can do about it. There are techniques we could use to eliminate them, and that's what I want to focus on right now. So I'm just give you another second to jot down that short link in case you want to laugh in the office today. We're not alone. So let's focus on how do we eliminate those filler words from our vocabulary. Well, let's talk about a few quick techniques. First, we have to practice our presentation. We talked earlier about this notion that it's not that we need to practice every word over and over again. Instead, we need to focus on the introduction, any particularly complex or difficult parts, and the conclusion. Yes, practice makes perfect, but practice also helps reduce filler word use. And so it's very, very important that we practice our presentation. One of the main reasons we get nervous, one of the main reasons that we tend to use filler words is because we're not confident with our material. We don't know our material as well as we should, as well as we'd like. So I urge all of you to practice your presentation. I know it's tough. I know we're busy. I know there are lots of things that our boss wants us to do. But it's so important that we put a meeting planner on our calendar that says practice time. Just like we put reminders on our calendar for birthdays or important meetings or work assignments, we have to build in time into our schedule, even 15 minutes for practice. It really will make the difference. It will calm us down and it will reduce filler words. Second, let me tell you about a quick technique called pause, think, and answer. And this is a technique I, I've researched and written about because it fights that tendency that we all have to answer as soon as we're called upon. That conditioning that I talked about earlier as one of the central reasons I argue in, in a recent blog post I wrote for Harvard, I argue in that blog post that this conditioning that's taken place has led us to not allow ourselves to pause, to jump in or begin speaking right away when that's not necessary. So instead, I want us, whenever we're answered a question, even though it's a default setting, a default public speaking behavior, to answer right away, we need to pause, give ourselves a moment to think, and then and only then should we answer. Pause, think, and answer. So as you'll see, when Tim asks me some questions during Q&A in just a few minutes, I'm going to pause, think for a moment or two about what I want to say, and then and only then answer. That pause at the beginning is so important because if we're not speaking, we can't say um. One of the other things that I think is really helpful is asking for feedback. Asking a trusted colleague at work, or as I mentioned earlier, using a recording device can be really helpful in getting feedback. But ask for it. Don't be afraid to find a mentor at work perhaps someone not in your chain of command or a colleague who tends to attend many of the same sessions or presentations or conferences as you, so that you can get real feedback. It's the only way to improve. It's the reason so many students and executives come back to take public speaking courses and other presentations courses because they want that feedback and many people don't get it in the work environment. So create it for yourself for free. Ask a trusted colleague for feedback on your next presentation. Count your filler words. Notice when you use them. And get some general presentation tips from someone who doesn't directly evaluate you so that you have the knowledge, so that we have the knowledge to improve our presentation skills and to reduce our filler word use. Last thing I want to say about filler words is that there tend to be what I call filler word hotspots. Two places in speech where filler words most commonly appear. 
at the beginning and in between thoughts. It's kind of like a five paragraph essay we used to write in English class when we were younger. We would tab or indent at the beginning of each paragraph and there's that white space between paragraph one and paragraph two in a single spaced essay. That same notion applies with where filler words most commonly appear. They appear at the beginning, when we're about to begin speaking, and when we're transitioning from one idea to another. So that's where we want to focus and especially pause, think, and then answer when we're speaking to eliminate our filler word use. Finally, I want to spend just a few minutes today on making the audience care about our message. How to make the audience, how to cut through the clutter and help the audience focus on what we have to say. One of the things I want to emphasize is we want to make it all about our audience. We want to make our presentation about them, about the people sitting in front of us so that they care. One of the best ways to do this, and it's something I've tried to do throughout today's webinar, is to use inclusive language. We want to replace the words you and your with we, our, and us. Listen to the difference between my saying, you need to solve this problem, versus we need to solve this problem. Hear the difference? The first one implies that the audience alone has to solve the problem, while the second implies that we, the speaker and the audience, will solve it together. And that's why today I've talked about how we need to become better speakers, and these are techniques we can use to reduce filler words. I've hesitated to say what you need to do and what your issues are, all of you on the line today, because I want all of us to work together and I want you to perceive me as being part of the solution. It's a great way to build trust and a great way to link ourselves to our audiences. Make our audience care by using inclusive language. Second, we want to reference the present. Referencing the present is about talking about our audience's current needs and challenges current needs and challenges. In other words, what do they really care about right now? We need to think about and link what we're saying to what they're currently facing. Whatever challenges they're currently facing, whether it's layoffs in the workplace, whether it's declining sales, whether it's a new product launch that is on everyone's minds, whatever it may be, we need to link our presentation to our audience's current needs and challenges, their current concerns, whatever's keeping them up at night, whatever they're focusing on. That's a great way to get our audience engaged. And even if our whole presentation isn't about that topic, let's find a way at the beginning of our presentation to make that link so that the audience doesn't have to make the mental jump themselves. We want them to focus on the present, on what we are talking about right now. Finally, we want to highlight the relevance. And that's all about the famous question, WIFM, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me, WIFM? One of the questions audiences want to know is, why should I do what you're asking? Here's the answer that you're going to give them. Because there are specific benefits to doing so. We need to be explicit about what's significant about a particular idea or product and what our audience gets out of it. In other, way, in other words, we need to delineate the benefits of doing what we're asking our audience to do. We want to explain why the audience should pay attention, what they get out of it, what benefits they get out of going along with what we are advocating or promulgating. So, for instance, if we want our audience to come with us and volunteer at a local homeless shelter, which is a cause I particularly care about, we want to delineate certain benefits. We might highlight the ideas that there's an opportunity to get to know one another better by volunteering together, or that we'll feel really good about ourselves when we're preparing food for some of the homeless people in our community, or that we'll laugh a lot as a group as we figure out how to run the kitchen. These are all benefits, and even though they may seem silly, it's much better than saying we should volunteer to homeless shelter because we'll make a difference in the lives of others. Yes, that's important, and yes, that's the reason people should volunteer, but humans are inherently selfish, and so we have to delineate specific benefits. That's why there are things like donor recognition programs and certificates and handwritten letters we get for supporting our favorite organizations or communities. People love seeing their names on donor rolls and on emails. 
So we need to do the same when we're presenting by highlighting specific benefits of doing what we're asking people to do. Instead of telling people we should do it because it'll improve or help other people, we should delineate what the audience gets out of doing what we're asking them to do. That focus on our audience is so important in helping our audience want to care and helping cut through all the competing messages out there. The last techniques I want to talk about today focus on owning the room. When we're standing in front of our audience and we're sharing all these messages, all these ideas that could help us connect with them, we want to move away from the lectern or the head of the table. We want to be of the people. And so it's so important that we allow ourselves, that we don't allow ourselves to make the table or the, the lectern, which some people call a podium, our crutch. We want to maintain an open posture. We want to keep our, our arms open. We want to gesture. And being at the very head of the table, especially with papers in front of us, looks in a way as though we are distracted or we're not as connected, I should say, with the people around us. So I prefer circular tables. In fact, if possible in your workplace, replace the table with a circular table if you can. Or instead of sitting behind a desk, sit next, not next to someone, but at an angle from someone. Great ways of owning the room and being more connected with the people in front of us. Move away from that lectern. Leave your notes on the lectern and walk away from it. Walk to its left or right and speak where they, the audience can see our hands instead of stare at a wooden lectern in front of us and not be able to see our bodies. And uh, additionally, it's helpful in owning the room, which is, a, by the way, a phrase I use in talking about being a leader and stepping up, getting some ownership of that room as though making the room where you're speaking yours or ours. We can approach or gesture toward individual audience members. We often forget the people on our left and on our right, our far left or far right. So move over toward them, move toward them. Let's make sure we walk toward the people to the far left of the room. Talk to them for a moment or two. Come back to the center, continue our presentation. And then when it feels right, when it's appropriate, walk or move toward or gesture toward the people on our right side and face them a bit more and talk to them for a few moments so that everyone in the room feels important. We don't want to focus just on the people directly in front of us. We want to make sure the people to our left and to our right feel engaged. So it's so important that we approach them, spend a few moments facing them and giving them a few complete thoughts so that they too feel engaged. They too feel like we care about them and that we're connected with them as leaders and as speakers. Again, we can do that through movement and we can do that using our hands when we gesture. Those techniques will help us own the room. So today, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll see here, by the way, in this photo, this idea of a circular table, and this idea, as I was saying, of being a leader and making everyone feel important as though we are part of the solution, and it's not just on them, but it's with all of us. It's together, not apart. So let's summarize what we learned today. Today we focused on leadership, how leaders speak, and my argument today is, as we talked about the fundamentals, that it's not just about speaking. It's about thinking and acting like a leader. It's about showing everyone we have what it takes to lead. We want to push nervousness aside using some of the breathing techniques we talked about and this notion of easing into eye contact. And of course, the importance of practicing in specific ways, the introduction, any particularly difficult or complex parts, and the conclusion. We talked about eliminating filler words and the value of pausing thinking and answering, and of making sure that we're focusing on everything good that we have to offer, visualizing ourselves succeeding, visualizing, visualizing rather ourselves not using filler words, and making sure that we're focusing on allowing for some silence, even though in our culture, silence is often perceived as a negative. In fact, we want to turn it into a positive so we sound more confident and competent. And of course, let's make it all about our audience. Let's use inclusive language. Let's reference the present and let's highlight the benefits of doing what we want our audience to do. And finally, don't forget about owning the room. Make the room yours by approaching and gesturing toward audience members and moving away from that lectern or the head of the table. 
Now, lastly, before I take questions, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, our conversation doesn't end today. As Tim will remind all of us in just a few moments, and as you'll receive by email, there's another webinar in two weeks that will help you take your skills to the next level. But you may also want to purchase a public speaking book. And certainly the one that I wrote is one option. It's called Lessons from the Podium, Public Speaking as a Leadership Art. And it contains in more depth many of the ideas we've talked about today and many more. It's a great book at a low cost to help us take our public speaking skills to the next level. And it's one that I wrote for professionals in mind. So it's not academic by any standards, very easy read. And one that I hope will help you become a more powerful public speaker. You may also want to consider joining Toastmasters International. Toastmasters is the world's largest speaking organization. There's literally a club in almost every major city in the world. And you can visit toastmasters.org and find a club near you. It's a low cost, low stress way to meet other people in your area and to practice your skills in a low stakes environment. Usually there's weekly meetings for one hour a week or every other week with people who are professionals and work and live in your area where you're dialing in from today. I also invite you to visit my website, stephendcohen.net. There are free resources there, some of links to articles I've written, both peer-reviewed and blog posts on many of the topics we talked about today. They go into much more depth than we had time to cover, but they're there for you to help you as a free resource and, and also some ideas and links to other techniques that you might use to take your skills to the next level. So please feel free to take advantage of those resources and contact me directly if I can be helpful. So Tim, let me just say finally here that I've really enjoyed our time together and I'm looking forward now to your questions about how we all can become better speakers, but more importantly, better leaders. Tim? Thank you, Stephen. Um, one of the questions that we had is, will this presentation be made available? And all of you that are listening today will receive a thank you email from the Alumni Association. Within that email, there will be a link to this presentation. That presentation will be available only for 72 hours. So when you get that email, know that you've got about 72 hours to listen to that presentation um, and see the the, the deck um, and it, and plan accordingly so you don't lose out. So our first question is, is how would you translate dressing one step above the audience for female speakers? For example, a business suit versus a dress. Great question. So the same principles apply. What we want to do is get a sense of what our audience is wearing and dress one step up. Now it's a little more difficult for females in terms of removing, let's say, a, a jacket. Whereas a gentleman could just simply take off a jacket or take off a tie and roll up sleeves, that may not work in a female context. So we want to dress appropriately and we can still perhaps wear a fancy brooch versus not wear a brooch. We could wear a more formal business suit versus something, maybe a pants, a pants outfit. That's a little less formal. So we just want to adjust our exact attire accordingly, but nevertheless, the same principle applies, male or female. We want to think about what our audience is wearing and then dress one step up so that we are perceived as an important yet accessible leader. Great question. The next question is from Bakul. Uh, excellent topic and delivery. In today's world, how do you adjust where so much of the business is done through teleconferencing? Mm, great question and so important. One of the things I tried to do today is involve the audience. And so even though it's more difficult because all of you can't see me and I don't have the pleasure of seeing you, we still can engage. So notice how I tried to use my voice as a tool. I tried to sound animated and excited. I raised my voice sometimes and I lowered my voice sometimes. Sometimes I'd emphasize a point. I used my voice as a technique to overcome the barrier, if you will, that comes from virtual communication. There's also the sense of using interactive exercises. So even though it seemed silly, I paused and made us go through some breathing exercises. I also asked you to write down some of your default public speaking settings and paused for about 20 seconds to allow us to do so. And now we're engaged through Q&A. So even though not all 100-something people on the phone today may have done those breathing exercises, 
at least that option was there and there was an opportunity for engagement. And so building in interactive activities and using poll questions, which we also had three of today, are great ways to overcome that barrier and show our audience that we care about them because we want to engage them. And if we show our audience we care about them, they're more likely to be engaged and they're more likely to participate, which ultimately is what we want from our audience. That connection between speaker and audience is what public speaking is really all about. Great. This uh, question is actually from Tim, but it could be from me also. Uh, I lose focus. <laughs> I lose focus on my points and get off track. How can I fix this? Also a great question. Don't be afraid to pause. Pausing is a very powerful tool. And often when we get ruffled, the first thing we do is apologize or we start ruffling through our notes and we look disorganized and disheveled. Sometimes what we want to do is take a moment to pause. There's nothing wrong with taking a few seconds to regain our composure and our place rather than look disheveled. So pausing is first a strategic tool that not only we can use to get people's attention because when we pause, people pay attention. They're like, wow, there was just silence. I need to stop what I'm doing and listen to the call to make sure I haven't lost the audio, which is perhaps what some of you thought for a split second there. So pausing can be used as a way to regain our audience's attention, but also to give ourselves a chance to regain our composure. But another reason that we may lose our place is because we're reading. We've written out our presentation word for word. And that's a big no-no in public speaking. When I work with private clients, I always focus on this notion of outlining versus writing down our presentations in a script-like format. And the reason for that is we can't lose our place if we're not reading a script. We can't get disheveled. So instead, we want to use an outline. We want to use bullet points. Need not be anything formal, but that will help us stay on target, stay focused on what we're sharing with our audience, and make sure that we are as successful as we want to be. Thanks for that question. We have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, this question is from Jim. I am very comfortable speaking in front of strangers, but panic when speaking to a group of coworkers. Any suggestions above and beyond your push nervous, nervousness aside slide? <laughs> well, this is a, a common issue that faces many of us. A great question. Look, what it comes down to is breathing exercises and easing into eye contact are, are great short-term solutions that can help us overcome that fear. But the main reason we're nervous is because we're nervous about being judged. And that's why visualization is so important. What I shared today really are the most commonly researched and taught techniques, this notion of visualization, these, this notion of anti-anxiety techniques that uh, involve both breathing exercises, turning the palms up and so forth, and then the focus on practice. It's not that we want to pick one. We want to do all of these in tandem. We can use them almost as though tools that when taken together helps us enhance our ability to speak with power. So it's not like we want to pick one off the shelf and just use that. We want to use them all. We want to practice in the ways we talked about today. We want to use anti-anxiety techniques when, when we need to. And we want to visualize, visualize ourselves succeeding both before the presentation and right as we're walking up. If we use these techniques together, will be far more successful than if we used any of them alone. Uh, Thanks again. This question is from Candace. When answering questions, I find that when I've completed my thought, I often taper off. How can I improve upon this? Yes, very common issue affecting speakers. And one of the reasons we trail off is because we don't know when to stop. What we want to do is when we feel like we've made our point, we want to stop speaking. And this is something I had to work on myself as a speaker. I enjoy speaking with people and I found myself sometimes going on about a question longer than I needed to. So now what I try to do is when I feel like I've made the point clearly, I stop speaking. Instead of reiterating the idea again and again. We tend to trail off at the end because we're not quite sure where to stop. So make the point carefully, make the point succinctly, and then let's stop speaking so we can take the next question. And with that, Tim, I'm ready for the next question. All right, this will be our last question, and this is from Malik. What is the right amount of time to pause or allow for white space? Two seconds seems like an eternity when you're in front of a group. 
I go from being confident to being self-conscious when I pause. Thank you, Malik. The, the truth is that it may seem like an eternity to you, but it's not an eternity, eternity rather, to the audience. That was two seconds right there. So it's a short pause. It may seem like an attorney, but it's actually quite short. And the truth is that, remember, our audience wants us to succeed. Our audience wants us to do well. So taking a moment to pause, even if the audience, for some reason, thinks it's longer, or we pause for longer than a couple seconds, that'll be quickly forgotten when the audience is impressed with the message that we deliver as the result of taking a few moments to gather our thoughts and speak with power. So as we close today, I want to thank all of you, and I know Tim has some closing comments here in a moment, but I want to thank you all for spending some time with me and talking about the fundamentals of how leaders speak. And I really want to encourage all of you, both today and, and in the future, to use the techniques we've talked about, because if we use them, not only will we improve our presentations, but for the first time in a long time, we'll show our audience members that we have what it takes to lead. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Stephen. We really appreciate it. Just a note, um, you should be receiving an email from the Alumni Association either later today or tomorrow. Um, in that email, uh, you will receive a link to the June 24th um, uh, second part of this series, so please sign up if you haven't already. You will receive a link to the presentation today that will be available for you for 72 hours, and there will also be a link for a short sur survey. Um, we appreciate any feedback that you can provide. Um, we do have two signed copies of Stephen's book, Lessons from the Podium, and we will be giving those away to two random winners uh, for those from those people that filled out the survey. So if you have any questions, regarding this or anything the Alumni Association presents, please email alumni at umd.edu and we will do our best to respond within 48 hours. And thank you, Stephen. Thank all of you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.